Hello and welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair and I'm so glad that you've joined me today. I have a very special guest. Her name is Maisa Thayer. Maisa, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate you just thank being you for having me. Everything that you have done is so amazing. Thank you. When I heard you speak at the press conference for the opening of Planned Parenthood, I was just so impressed by everything that you're doing. So I'm excited that you're here to talk a little bit about that um, with us. I know that you have you have some stuff that's happened to you in the past too that mm -hmm. um, is sort of what has prompted you or motivated you to want to step out and make a difference. And so I, can you tell us a little bit about sure, that? Sure, yeah. So I went to the Maritime Academy in California and I drove ships from 18 years old to 28. I worked on tugboats here in Hawaii at 18, 18 years old. And then I worked on container ships, research vessels. Oh, wow. And small cargo ships around the Pacific. And then uh, cruise ships is where I, my last job was. Yeah. Wow. That must have been so good. You get to go to so many different places, right? Yeah, I traveled the world on ships. And it was, it was a wonderful life, but it was very difficult being the only female in a male-dominated industry and right. they reminded me of that every day um wow. so i experienced a lot of workplace harassment um and abuse there I'm so sorry yeah so you were like the only girl on the ships and like the only girl you were all by yourself on the ship with all these men oh yeah. my god before i got to cruise ships i was the only female on most of the ships um <sighs> especially container ships you know it's a really small crew of like 24 so 24 men and one female and being uh, 18 to 28 and th through your 20s, it was a really different environment to grow right. up in. Sure, and you're gorgeous, so that's another <laughs> factor in there too, because yeah. they think they well, it's quite the unfortunate factor. A very pretty girl. So. <laughs> well, it was yeah. an unfortunate factor. I'm sorry. Wow. Yeah, and so just um, got really tired of the harassment and the abuse and waking up every day and having to prove myself as a female every single day, even if I was on the ship for two years with them. Um, it was still harassment and abuse from the, everyone from the captain to the deckhands to the longshoremen. It was, um, they wanted to remind you it was a, it was a male industry. Yeah, you're just, yeah. A, you're just a girl, right? Oh yeah. my gosh. So there, was there physical um, assault in there too, or did they yeah. just like say things to I you? I mean, the assault, uh, varied everything from them coming into my room while I was sleeping oh my. and attacking me to uh, being on deck and getting attacked by longshoremen to like a captain abusing me, like everything, yeah. And it was, um, it got to a point where as a woman you just kind of think like this is what it, it it's going to be in this industry, just it's my fault for trying to break into this, Aww. so I somewhat deserve... Uh, this is just the name of the game. You know, you got to play it. No one deserves that. Look, you know, yeah. didn't we just hear from Martha McSally too? Um, yes, the to, senator. Yes, finally spoke. came out. Yeah, that was really touching. Um, as a survivor of right. similar industry, um, sailing or any type of industry that you have like industrial um, type of hierarchy as well. Right, and you have superiors that want to continue to put the female in her place. And, and, and Senator McCauley came out saying that she was actually raped by a superior. So taking advantage of power, basically. Right. And that's what yeah. really it always is anyway, right? It's not a matter of sex. It's just a matter of power and control. Totally. I know for me and my own abuse, that's what it was always. It was just a matter of power and control. Yeah. You know, here it is that the day of the voice, and it's like, the International Day of the Woman. Right, that's today. today right? Yes. So happy yeah. Women's Day. Thank you, you too. <laughs> Thank you. Um, but you know, as I looked into it a little bit, we're U.S., the United States, is in 65th place as far as having um, equity in business for women, women's yes. equity in business. That's where number 65 in the list of countries. That's how far down we are. Yeah. We got a long ways to go. It's disappointing, and I think, like, as a girl from Hawaii, um, I was a water woman, and I never thought I couldn't do anything. You know, I was like, I'm a surfer. I can drive. I've been driving boats across the channels here in Hawaii my whole life. So to go to the Maritime Academy and, like, be one of 50 women with 800 men and suddenly oh. feel for the first time ever that, like, 
the waterfront was not for me oh, was a really uh -huh. horrible feeling because I never felt, uh, I thought that we were all equal, you know, right. until that was like a rough uh, realization for sure. Right, yeah. and you're with men that are from all over the country too, right? Yeah. Not just guys from Hawaii. Right. Because I would think guys from Hawaii would go, yeah, it's you know, surfer girl. Yeah, come on. Right? Sometimes. It seems like there's a better attitude Sometimes. here. <laughs> oh, really? Not so much, maybe. <laughs> you wouldn't challenge the watermen too much. Oh, uh, right. <laughs> yes, okay. Yeah. <laughs> I don't go on the surfboards anymore, so I, I don't have yeah. to worry about that. But it just seems like there's more... Um, I don't know what the word I'm looking for is. More inclusion for women here in Hawaii than when I was on the mainland. Because yeah. I was a minister in the South where it's an all-boys club, too. So I kind right. of I have some experience with that. Not not like you in any way, but but right. just at that exclusion for women. You know, you're just a dumb girl. You don't belong here, which is a terrible way to feel. And no one should have to deal with that at all. No. But so you decided you didn't want to do that anymore, and you started yeah. to go to school. And first you told me right. you were online, right? And then yeah. then you started at HPU. And I really mm -hmm. want you to talk a little bit about this intervention that you for your um, your thesis, your master's thesis. Is that yeah. right? Okay, tell us about so that. I really like the saying: "Make your pain your purpose." And um, okay. wait, wait, say that again. Make your pain your purpose. Oh, I like that. Oh, yeah. Right. Can I use that? I really yes. like that one. Yeah. Make totally. your pain your purpose. I mean, you know that as well. It's kind of me as well. I like that. <laughs> and I think, like, like if, you saw, if you've had 10 years of abuse, like I did, um, to the degree of, like, why is this all happening to me? Like, um, right. do I deserve it? Is it, you know, it's me and not other people, so it must mean that I deserve it. And um, when you start to realize that it's you can actually gain a lot of strength out of that pain right and so i uh after a lot of the worst abuse happened it was really affecting me in my relationships you know i i had ptsd i was like triggered all the time really generalizing all men and then i put myself into some help Thankfully, I'm a huge right. advocate for mental health. I am too, yeah. absolutely. So, and I think it, it, you can't go wrong. Well, you can't go wrong. Because if you <laughs> get a bad, if you get, I just thought about that. I thought, wait a minute. <laughs> yeah. If you get a bad counselor, they can really lead you the wrong way. So it's important to remember to find right. the right person who's really fully qualified and has specific um, experience in what you specifically deal with. Like some are better for domestic violence, some are better for child abuse. Some you know, find one that specializes in in where your pain comes from. Right? But I think some people don't even know where their pain comes from. Right. And I didn't know for a long time, and so to make my pain mm -hmm. my purpose, I had to identify what the pain was. Ah, right. Because for so long I was like, I'm good. I don't. I'm good. I'm, I don't need help. And. Um, working with someone that was like, no, like, you have PTSD and you are hyper vigilant all the time around men. Right. And, and then, PTSD, for those yeah. that don't know, it's post-traumatic stress disorder. And it comes from being involved in traumatic things. Now, we used to just apply it for men and, you know, so soldiers and servicemen coming back from the war. But it really applies to, across the board, any kind of abuse. Well... We're very social creatures, so anytime you have a traumatic event and you don't speak about it, it goes deeper and deeper and deeper into your psyche. Right. That's PTSD. Like, if you have a traumatic event and you can come talk to someone about it and you unload that energy, you might not get PTSD. Right. Not every traumatic event results in that. But if you have a traumatic event and you don't talk to anyone for weeks, it builds into where right now it's messing up your basic function. Right. So... I made my pain my purpose. I put myself into social work. Um, and that's your major, right? That's my major. Okay. And, the, and the universe works in mysterious ways. <laughs> and I got offered a position at Title IX at HPU. And Title mm -hmm. IX is the department. Um, we had all the rape, abuse, and discrimination cases on campus. So I became the graduate assistant to the Title IX nice. uh, coordinator at HPU. That's like the perfect job too, right? Totally. You know, that hypervigilance that you were talking about, that's yeah. the thing that, that is so um, exhausting. It just yeah. drains your body because you have to constantly make sure, you know, where you are. You want to know your surroundings. Like when, for me, when I go to a restaurant, I cannot sit in the middle 
of the restaurant. I have to have my back up against the wall. Right. I, I do not feel right if my back is towards the door. Stuff like that always because, and it's that hypervigilance, hypervigilance. thing vigilance that, that's coming in and sort of just taking over when I don't even realize and what's happening. And it affects your everyday interactions and relationships. Right. Absolutely having a healthy relationship and not um, thinking that you're going to be attacked or something like that. Right. Exactly. Yeah. So that led you to this intervention idea, that this yes. project that you're going to be doing. Tell us about that. So um, for my graduate thesis, I, I decided that, well, I did a lot of work with Title IX, and I just saw that there's this, there's a lot of common stories of abuse, and why do, why do people hurt people? It's because people hurt people hurt people. And <laughs> if I can help anyone release that energy to, of that pain, then I would like to help them do that. So I kind of created this intervention um, to hope that it's a, based in an, a Native American healing circle. And Native American healing circles, it's a community ritual to pass pain. Yeah. It's what it is. And um, we've kind of lost our communal healing techniques. Yes, we have. And we're just telling everyone, go heal on your own as an individual and individual psychotherapy. And um, there's actually, we can heal a lot faster as a collective um, not like in towns, but in, in group session. Right. Um, and, and it's really powerful. People actually shift faster next to each other. Once an emotion goes across the group, it's called the collective effervescence. So it shifts. <laughs> I like that. It shifts people right. quicker. That so it's sense. a healing circle. It has six stages. It's based in a Native American uh, healing circle, which is very similar to Ho'oponopono. And uh, it just provides survivors an opportunity to have a group ritual for the pain caused to release the pain i think that's so important that we be specific and intentional yeah so i know for me when i first started to heal and i was intentional about doing things like that making rituals for myself yes. that were specific and repetitive so that i would continue to remind myself that I have to get rid of this stuff, right? Yes. Because it does just stay inside you and then cause all sorts of other things that right. that are, are that will get you into trouble. Right. So you're going to have six people, right? So I'm going to get eight survivors, eight survivors and eight uh, male allies. That's what I call them. And uh, we're going to go through the stages of the healing circle together. But the middle of the healing circle is going to be the survivors' um, choosing one male ally to stand in the middle with them and be a holding a psychological holding space uh, for to receive their expression and the survivor is going to express for three minutes onto the male ally uh, their feelings towards the masculine at this point um, and you never know who they might express onto it might be the offender or it could be a father that didn't protect them like we have no idea what's gonna kind of right. come out of that space but um it's, it's an opportunity for the survivor to regain empowerment and what they wish they could say because all too often survivors don't get to address their right. offender from a place of power right. they choose not to because they're afraid they right. feel too uh compassionate to the offender they don't want to cause any more harm right. to them or their families they don't uh maybe ever see them again. So kind of giving them the opportunity, if they could see them again, what would you like to get out? What would you, you know? say? I think Wouldn't that's that great. <laughs> okay, all right, we have to take a break. So okay. um, I'm hoping that you all will stay with me because we have some clips from her recent uh, production that she put together called the Me Too Monologues, and I really think that you will be... Um, you will be affected, and I think it's great. So I hope you'll stay. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. This is Think Tech Hawaii on Finding Respect in the Chaos. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, let's take healthy back. Aloha. Aloha, 
This is Winston Welch. I am your host of Out and About, where every other week, Mondays at three, we explore a variety of topics in our city, state, nation, and world, and uh, events, organizations, the people that fuel them. It's a really interesting show. We welcome you to tune in, and we welcome your suggestions for shows. Um, you got a lot of them out there, and we have an awesome uh, studio here where we can get your ideas out as well. So I look forward to you tuning in every other week where we've got some great guests and great topics. You're going to learn a lot. You're going to come away inspired like I do. So I'll see you every other week here at 3 o'clock on Monday afternoon. Aloha. <laughs> Welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos here on Think Tech Hawaii. I am here with my Sathayer. And I hope you saw the first part, but if you didn't, she's an amazing woman who is just about to graduate from HPU. And while she was there, she started um, a program. It's not really theater a program. Production. It's a theater production called the Me Too Monologues. And it was a, a chance to continue the dialogue. Kind of like the same thing that prompted me to do this show yes. was that I wanted to continue the dialogue. I want to make sure people keep talking about this yes. because until we keep talking about it, get it out in the open and re you know, release all that shame, yes. we're never going to get anywhere. So that's why I keep talking about it. And I'm really proud of you. And I think you're brilliant. So thank you for doing the work <clears throat> you do. <laughs> yeah, I just sit here and tell people, come on, tell your story. <laughs> okay, we have some clips for you guys that are just remarkable from the Me Too monologue. So um, if you could roll those clips now, that would be wonderful. Again, and you, you said you wanted a blowjob, and I reached in my throat, and I said, no, I'm sick, it's sore, not this time, any excuse. Number 12, we were driving to the parking lot, and you said you wanted a blowjob, and that you shouldn't have to ask, and it's payment. And I did it. I did it because you were in a really bad mood that day. And number 13, we were, you wanted sex again. And, and I was so tired of fighting you, so very tired. And you got blood on your shirt. You were really angry at that. And then, and then I filed the complaint. Too. Next, I remember my skin dripping with someone else's sweat. I could feel it as he let himself in, as I let out pointless cries for help. No one could hear me but him. No one was near me but him. It was cold and dark, and I could not hold my head up, face down in the back of a cop car, hands cuffed behind my back, dress hiked up past my chest. All I could see was his breath. Slow almost motionless in the cold winter air. Door wide open as he dared to dominate and violate me against my will. Suddenly, everything went still. My next clear memory is him being awfully friendly at the station. He says we can wait to go in gives me his cell phone number on the back of his card and says, if I go to church with him next Sunday, he'll have my case dismissed. He and they wonder why I don't walk around smiling. I thought my smile to be too inviting, inciting violence against my body I wasn't asking for. So my scowl is a mask I wear for protection against men who wear their entitlement on their sleeve. I come off unapproachable, angry, violent, like, like a time bomb waiting to explode because, well, I want you to see no in my face when you look at it. No, I am not asking for it. No, I do not give consent. No, no, no. Wow. Yeah. Welcome back. <laughs> that was quite it. That's an amazing, I can't even imagine the whole entire show. Yeah. I can't even imagine how effective that had to have been for people. I would imagine everybody was crying like 
the cast, the audience, <laughs> everybody. Because it's so amazing to yeah. see that kind of powerful, raw emotion. And that's what people have an issue with. They go, oh, I don't want that. It, you know, we as people don't want to look at anything ugly. And they've proven that with, you know, I'm sure you saw the, the studies where they have babies that they show them, you know, pretty faces and not so pretty faces. Right. And see which one they go for. Right. <clears throat> Always they gravitate to the pretty face. We as people want to gravitate to pretty things, yeah. which makes those ugly things prolificate because we don't look at them. Yeah, it was, right? un it was unfortunate to not have uh, more people in the audience, you know, when you're bearing your soul. But, like, people are like, well, I don't want to go to that on a Friday night. That's heavy. And I'm well, like, it's heavy, but, like, it's, it's people's truth and yeah. it's their life. And um, it's the whole human experience. Right. You know what I mean? That's the whole human experience. Right. And it needs to be the whole yeah. experience. You know, I had not remembered my abuse until I was 30. And I had a friend of mine say, if you could go back and, you know, go back to being ignorant of all of this, would you go back? And I'm like, no. No, because no, I'm a whole person now. Yes, yes. You know, I'm not just going through the motions anymore. I really feel them. And granted, I feel the rage and the pain and all these other things too, but totally. I also feel joy for the first time in my whole life. And I'm like hooked, right? I want more of that. That feels good. Yeah. So I think it's important for people to remember that in order for survivors to feel that joy, they need to be able to safely feel the rage yes. and the pain also. Um, one of my professors at HBU, Dr. Daniels, always says, feelings is like a vice grip. If you cut out the pain you cut out the joy and then you're just feeling within this right and then if you open up to the pain you open up and then you just you get the whole spectrum right and um making this show was extremely painful right. um i've never had a labor of uh emotion be so hard before right. my entire cast as well we sure. put ourselves through it like right. hearing those words and that yeah. narrative um all super raw and open but in the end um we called each other a week or so later we had all shifted majorly wow. we had all experienced major major shifts of releasing that energy and kind of um integrating into one person again we did not deny our shadow side anymore you know right. uh, it was i have testimony from the actors and, and survivors um, because the monologues were half performed by survivors and half performed by actors. Oh, right. So okay. So that piece that you saw, Destiny, with the two women, that's Destiny's piece. She's a survivor. And um, it abstracted the actors and the survivors. We, we all went through something and changed. Right. We shifted a lot. What gave you the idea initially? Was just from the Me Too movement, and then you thought, let's yeah. keep this going, or how'd that work? Yeah, the Me Too movement, um, and then Title IX was like, let's do an awareness event, oh, uh, yeah. and let's do the vagina monologues. And I was like, no, nah, that's old. Like, We need <laughs> something more current. Like, There's, there's a right. heavy current right now, and um, I keep seeing these cases come across my desk, and for too long, it's a woman issue and i right. and i if you do watch the monologues there's men in there there's a few male monologues the last monologue is a male monologue written by a man abused by a man um and so i think that we need to not make it just a female issue right it's a human issue it's a human rights and when issue you, that's right when you hear the stories we had some people come in that were anti me too movement and i was like that's fine come on in sit down and so they watched the whole show <laughs> And at the end of the show, they like were crying, and they were like, <laughs> and they were like, "We get it. Yeah, we felt it. We get it." And that's when I realized in that moment, yeah, we cannot always argue point to point, red and blue, right and left. These are my points. This is what happened. Blah blah. blah. You have to feel it to right. really shift someone. Right. It's about feeling. It's not just me telling you the facts, right. or like Dr. Blazy Ford telling you all the facts. Oh, you can't remember the facts. It didn't happen. You need to feel it, and right. then when you feel it, now you're we're equal, right? And that's what the monologues provided. 
Yeah. I think it should keep going on. But you were telling yeah. me something about you. You won't. Well, you're graduating. So I'm they, graduating. And yeah. it's an HBU program. So if it's considered yeah. an HBU program and you're gone, we used to. Is it still your program that you can take it with you and maybe uh, I don't know re start it up again somewhere else? Or, yeah, or I would something? love to start it up again somewhere else. Um, so you'll be here in Hawaii. Yeah, still. I'll be here in Hawaii trying to do my healing circles for survivors and maybe more me to monologue shows. Yeah. I think that would be great. I know that you could sure count me in on it if you cool. want. Um, awesome. Whatever I can do to help as far as, you know, putting the word out there for you. Thank you. I got a few um, memories in my past. <laughs> I think I sent you memories, yeah. right? Yeah. yeah. So I got really a few powerful. things that, You could have been in the show. I had a few things that could maybe come out if nothing else even totally. if there's no place for me in the show i want to support the show in any yes. way that i can well the show brings really good dialogue we had amazing q a for like an hour and a half even longer than the show wow sometimes because people were like it's a lot to digest so first they're just like <laughs> right. and then they start talking and um it was good to have that community dialogue right how often do we sit as a community and talk about right things where we could do better every day with each other. Right. Yeah. Right. You know, I, I'm a firm believer in we need to get men involved because until men yeah. get involved, we're not going to get anywhere. Um, there's right. a program called the White Ribbon Campaign. I learned about it in Geneva, Switzerland, when I was on my trip around the world, oh, yeah, right? Awesome. And it actually started in Canada, which is funny because that was the last place I went Canada, and then I find out, wow, it started here? What? I learned about it. <laughs> and anyway, I brought back a bunch of white ribbons, and I've been trying to pin them on my, every man I can find. <laughs> and every time I do, they have to take an oath, and it says, I will not commit, condone, or keep silent about yes. violence against women and girls. And so I've been trying to make that white ribbon campaign get going here, because I believe we have to get men involved, because yes. until we do... We're not going to get anywhere. It's not just a women's issue. It's not just a women's issue, but I also did a lot, a lot, of, a lot of research um, for my thesis, and it's a behavior. It's right. not a gender. So I think, like, right. really often I do this work, and people are like, "You're a feminist. You hate men." No, not at all. I love men. I have a lot of empathy for men. Um, I do think it's a behavior that is instilled in them more than women. Right. Women also can take on the behavior to gain um, higher parts of society, to gain leadership, they'll take on the behavior. But it's just a behavior of having power over other people. Right, because it's like about we control about and power. In the beginning. So yep. it's a behavior. It's not to a gender. Unfortunately, one gender seems to embody it more. <laughs> and that's it. You know? <laughs> that's right. Oh, my gosh. And we're out of time. And I just can't believe we're already out of time because I could talk to you for about two hours on this subject. Me too. It's an important subject, and I'm really grateful for everything that you're doing out there. Thank you so thank much, you. Maisa. And I want to thank everybody out there for coming to join me and Maisa today here on Finding Respect in the Chaos on Think Tech Hawaii. And I hope that you will join me next time. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair.